Chapter 88 The Unmuzzled Ox Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4 Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4 This is a verse with a long history of attention and neglect. If it were used as often as it is cited, the world would be very different. This text is cited more than once in the New Testament. Although St. Paul supported himself, he insisted on the duty of Christians to support their leaders. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7-11, to 11, he writes, Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth the vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plough in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Paul declares that a soldier must be paid, a farmer or a rancher gain a living from his work. God's law requires that an ox threshing corn is entitled to have some corn. The point of this law is that, as creatures, we are dependent upon our work for our sustenance. As a result, those who work as ministers of the Word of God are entitled to be paid for their work. If the law of Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4 validates the duty to feed the ox, how much more does it not vindicate the paying of God's servants? Paul again discusses this law in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. Paul, in the final sentence, was quoting our Lord's application of this law in his charge to the disciples. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Matthew chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. The word translated as scrip in verse 10 refers to a leather pouch for carrying food. In other words, our Lord requires those ministered to that they fully support the ministers. When Paul speaks of those who minister well that they receive double honour, the Greek word translated as honour means both pay and honour. Thus, double pay is required. Paul uses this law of Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4, as does our Lord. It is very clearly a law about payment for work. The value of the work must determine the pay. All work must be rewarded, but because there is a gradation of importance, there is a gradation of pay. Now, God knows that what we truly want, we will pay dearly for. His concern is that we recognise that in the things we need, the ministry of his word in particular, we recognise our moral obligation to pay well for. Paul does not mean in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 10 that God's only focus is on us. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verses 6 and 7 make clear his protection of even birds. Rather, the point is that God's law here requires us, above all else, 
to see our duty to our fellow men. We have an aspect of this law in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. There is a clear-cut pattern here. We are told that the practice of gleaning is required by God and that animals that help with the work must be permitted to eat freely. No right to glean is given to the poor. There is a duty to permit gleaning. Thus, both the needy persons and the working animals are required by God to be provided for. No man can live unto himself or only for himself in God's law. This law is basic to what we now call labour relations. Moorcraft summed up the matter very ably, stating, Animals are not to be robbed of what is due them. How much more heinous is it to rob a man of the honour or wages due him? We have here an important premise with respect to the treatment of animals, and at the same time the treatment of all workers. We need to look again at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, where Paul insists that this law is given for our sakes. The meaning is that, important as the fair treatment of animals and people certainly is, obedience to God is more important. For the sake of our growth in the faith and our growth in obedience, God requires that we be mindful of the ox and of all animals. His laws are for our sakes, in order that we may live a happier and more blessed life. A few people have used this text to say that the workers should share in the profits. Nothing of the sort is even implied. We are simply commanded to be just in the recompense of both animals and men. Thomas Scott's observation on this text is noteworthy. Kindness is due not only to men, but even to the beasts, and every living creature which contributes to our ease, pleasure, or advantage should receive from us such reciprocal satisfactions as it is capable of, in proportion to the benefits conferred, much more then should servants and labourers be suitably recompensed, and, by parity of reason, ministers, who are instrumental to men's salvation, should be maintained comfortably at their expense. What Scott is affirming is a harmony of interests under God of men and of men and their domestic animals. This harmony is a moral harmony whose premise is God's total and providential government. The direction of humanistic thinking is to stress a radical conflict of interests. Darwinism has done much to promote this belief in conflict because it is a presupposition of the idea of natural selection and the struggle for survival. The influence of the evolutionary ideology has been anti-capitalistic because of this stress on conflict. We have, as a result, racial, economic and political conflicts all over the world. Freedom has receded in the 20th century because of these conflicts. In an evolutionary universe, there is only struggle and conflict. Truth is tentative, and the development of man may render each day's truth irrelevant in the days to come. We live in a world of conflicts, not under God's harmony, according to this perspective. Our legal systems have echoes of this and other laws, but they are all steadily eroding. We are moving into a culture of the muzzled ox and the muzzled man. Freedom is associated by the modern mind with license, not morality, and the desire for freedom has come to mean the desire to sin. We have thinkers who claim to be Christian who insist on seeing God and Christ as process in terms of Darwinian thinking. In such thinking, the trinity of orthodox faith is gone, and so too is God's law. 
what we have instead is a cosmic process. Is it any wonder that the followers of such thinking have been the pioneers of our present lawlessness? No God, no law, no truth, no true morality. The wasteland surrounds us. The unmuzzled ox is a reminder of God's order and harmony 